thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from Canberra in Australia, from the traditional lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and I extend those respects to any First Nations peoples participating in this symposium. And I should also note that my paper has expanded from its original focus on New Guinea to consider German perceptions of cannibalism in the Pacific more broadly. German-speaking intellectuals during the long 19th century were both fascinated and repelled by reports of cannibalism in the Pacific. While some saw cannibalism as the clearest indication of savagery, others believed that cannibal practices could coexist with civilised behaviours or viewed them through a prism of moral relativism, describing them as practices passed down by custom and independent of morality. This paper analyzes German language publications on the topic of cannibalism in the Pacific during the long 19th century and considers the ways in which they depicted cannibalism and the sources upon which these depictions were based. Prior to the late 19th century, European voyages to the Pacific were dominated by the Spanish and Portuguese, then the Dutch, British and French, with significant contributions by the Russians and Americans. Although Germany did not exist as a nation before 1871, German-speaking individuals frequently accompanied other nations' voyages to the Pacific. Among the earliest examples were the father and son Johann Reinhold Forster and Georg Forster, who sailed as naturalists with James Cook on his second Pacific voyage of 1772 to 75. The best known instance of cannibalism encountered on this voyage occurred in 1773 at Indian Cove, now known as Totaranui in the South Island of New Zealand. Georg Forster recorded that some of the lieutenants went to the Indian Cove with a view to trade with the natives. The first objects which struck them were the entrails of a human corpse lying on a heap a few steps from the water. They were hardly recovered from their first surprise when the natives showed them several limbs of the body and expressed by words and gestures that they had eaten the rest. Forster noted that the crew's responses varied. Some did not seem greatly disinclined to join the feast. Some were so unreasonably incensed against the perpetrators that they declared they could be well pleased to shoot them all. A few suffered the same effects as from a dose of ipecacuana, in other words, they vomited, and the rest lamented this action as a brutal deprivation of human nature. Forster himself suggested that the action of eating human flesh whatever our education may teach us to the contrary, is certainly neither unnatural or criminal in itself. He considered it dangerous only as far as it steels the mind against that compassionate fellow feeling, which is the great basis of civil society. He also cautioned that Europeans were more than capable of committing barbarities without example amongst cannibals. We do not find it unnaturally and savagely cruel to take the field and to cut one another's throats by thousands. Is it not from prejudice that we are disgusted with the idea of eating a dead man when we feel no remorse in depriving him of life? Georg Forster's father, Johann Reinhold, took a less accommodating view of cannibalism than his son, condemning it as an unnatural custom and the Maori who practiced it as implacable and cruel enemies carrying their thirst for revenge even to such a degree of inhumanity as to feast upon their in unfortunate prisoners. However, he also identified many positive qualities amongst the Maori, describing them as hospitable, sincere and generous friends, intrepid and bold warriors and men of sound understanding. Importantly, Johann Reinhold Forster also considered cannibalism one of several cultural and physical markers distinguishing the two great varieties of people he thought he had observed in the South Seas. He believed the first variety inhabited Otaheite and the Society Isles, the Marquesas, the Friendly Isles, that's Tonga, Easter Island and New Zealand, while the second peopled New Caledonia, Tanna, and the New Hebrides, 
He hypothesized that the first and Aboriginal inhabitants of the South Sea Isles were of the tribe of the Papuas and people from New Guinea and its neighbourhood, and that at a later date, the ancient Malays of the peninsula had gradually spread from Borneo to the Philippines, Micronesia and Polynesia. In Tonga and the Society Islands, he believed these more civilised conquerors had established a mild and humane kind of government and endeavoured to wean their new subjects from that cruel cannibalism which generally prevailed among all the Aboriginal black tribes of the South Sea. This hypothesis was based partly on information communicated to Forster by the Indigenous inhabitants of the various islands he had visited. For example, in Tahiti, only a faint tradition of the existence of cannibalism had been preserved, whereas in Vanuatu he believed it was still actively practised. He recalled that the natives of Tanna gave us more than once to understand that if we penetrated far into the country against their will and without our permission, uh, their permission, they would kill us, cut our bodies up and eat them. New Zealand was an obvious outlier to Forster's theory that cannibalism was characteristic of the Aboriginal black tribes of the Pacific. He attempted to explain this dissonance by suggesting that in New Zealand, the more civilised Malay tribes had mixed with the Aboriginals and the harshness of the climate, the roughness of the wild, woody country, together with its great extent, contributed to preserve cannibalism and to form a coalition of customs wherein many points of civilization were totally lost. The example of the Forsters' father and son demonstrates that responses to cannibalism in the Pacific could vary even between members of the same family. Thirty years later, similarly diverse responses to cannibalism in a different part of the Pacific were expressed by German-speaking members of the first Russian Round the World expedition, which spent 12 days on Nukuhiva in the Marquesas Islands in 1804. Expedition leader Adam Johann von Kosenstern, a Baltic German from Estland province in the Russian Empire, claimed in times of famine the men butcher their wives and children and their aged parents. They bake and stew their flesh and devour it with the greatest satisfaction. He considered cannibalism a most unnatural act and believed the Nukuhivans deserved to be called not people but wild animals. Georg Heinrich von Langsdorf, a German-born medical doctor who accompanied the expedition as a naturalist, also believed that the Nukuhivans eat their friends if pressed by hunger and their enemies from hatred or custom, but he relativised the practice describing it as an ancient custom inherited from their fathers and grandfathers, which they no more think repulsive than we do the consumption of a piece of beef. He added that cannibalism was practised by many other nations and reminded his readers that it is certain that our own forefathers followed this custom. His compatriot Hermann Ludwig von Löwenstern took a similar view, asking if it is indeed true that in the rage of war civilised Europeans are not ashamed of eating their enemy's flesh, then how can the savages be reproached for it? Importantly, none of the members of this expedition claimed to have witnessed cannibal practices themselves. Their information was drawn primarily from two European beachcombers living on Nukuhiva, Edward Roberts and Joseph Cabri, uh, Joseph Cabri, he was a Frenchman, and supplemented with circumstantial evidence, in particular the existence of ornamented skulls or ipu'u'u carried by Nukuhivan men. You can see one in the picture there. If we now jump forward in time to the late 19th century, we see a comparable diversity of views towards cannibalism in the works of two German traveller naturalists who visited New Guinea in the 1870s and 1880s. Adolf Bernhard Meyer spent five months in what is now West Papua in 1873. By this time, the German word Papua, meaning a Papuan person, carried strong connotations of primitivity, savagery and cannibalism. It was applied initially to the indigenous inhabitants of New Guinea, but it could also be used to designate a primitive form of human development independent of the person's perceived ethnicity. In this broader sense, I think it would have been similar to describing someone as a savage. Meyer's travels led him to conclude that not all Papuans were the same. 
He insisted that there are in New Guinea, alongside bloodthirsty and untamed savages, also men of milder customs. He did not observe cannibalism anywhere in New Guinea, but believed reports of its existence and considered it an incontrovertible proof of savagery, associating it with nakedness, nomadism and other cultural phenomena he considered representative of the lowest stage of human development. However, he also seems to have considered some forms of cannibalism more acceptable than others. And here's a representative quote. There are cannibals in various parts of northwest New Guinea, but they do not all occupy the same stage of development as far as this custom is concerned. In some areas, the custom has already vanished for various reasons, and only faint traces recur as exceptions to the rule, whereas among other tribes, human flesh is still such a regular part of the diet that even relatives who have died a natural death are eaten. Meyer's compatriot Otto Finch travelled extensively in the Pacific during the years 1879 to 82 and 1884 to 85. He had developed an interest in the Pacific well before this, and in 1865 published Neuguinea und seine Bewohner, New Guinea and its Inhabitants, the first German language monograph on the topic. Drawing on accounts from French and Dutch expeditions to the region, he defended New Guinea's indigenous inhabitants against a blanket charge of cannibalism, but unproblematically associated the practice per se with savagery. Like Meyer, he focused on lifeways more broadly as a means of ranking different population groups. He identified the people living along the Princess Mariana Strait in the southwest as without doubt the crudest of New Guinea's indigenous inhabitants, since they were said to be completely naked, they had no fixed abodes, and they obtained their food from hunting and various wild-growing fruits. Finch's straightforward association between cultural practices and developmental stages was disrupted by his experiences on Matapit Island in East New Britain, where he spent a total of eight months in 1880 and 1881. He was aware before his arrival that the island's indigenous inhabitants had the ill reputation of being naked savages and cannibals. He also claimed to have become acquainted with their horrible cannibal practices from personal experience during his stay. I arrived just in time to witness the dreadful spectacle, he wrote, in the article that accompanied this image. To my amazement, no wide give me that. No wild howl of victory was raised, as one expects from savages. On the contrary, everything proceeded as quietly as though something quite ordinary were taking place. The picture which I sketched from life, represents the scene as the victors cut up the body of the slain man in workmanlike fashion in the shallow waters of the bay. Smoking their pipes, meanwhile, the young man with the flute plays his sweetest airs just as usual, and the crowd squat on the strand as spectators. And really um, what becomes clear from, from Finch's writings um, based on his experiences in New Guinea as, as opposed to what he wrote before he'd actually been there is that the lifeways of the Matapit Islanders just really didn't fit into his preconceived categories. He explained, people who have complete and beautifully tended plantations, who lay out ornamental gardens and possess other almost artistic works, who are very accomplished in song and dance, and who, above all, understand commerce as perfectly as do the New Britons, cannot very well be called savages. Finch later extrapolated his observations on Matapit Island to the whole of New Guinea, arguing that the Papuans' cultivation of the land represented a characteristic of the whole race and an advantageous proof of the higher grade of their civilised behaviour, which neither nakedness nor cannibalism could attenuate. His views on cannibalism per se were mixed. Sometimes he described it as an abhorrent custom blemishing an otherwise well-disposed people. At other times he conceded that nakedness and cannibalism were evils only in our eyes. In reality, they are practices passed down by custom, independent of civilised behaviour and morality. I hope I've given you 
some idea of the diversity of ways in which cannibalism in the Pacific was depicted by German-speaking intellectuals during the long 19th century. Unfortunately, the questions of why these depictions varied so greatly and how they functioned within German language social discourse of beyond the scope of this paper, though I'm hoping to um, consider them in the in the written version. Um, thank you for listening. Apologies for the dog, who, of course, was sleeping perfectly peacefully until I started to talk, uh, and I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh Thank you so much, Hilary. Uh, it was a very, very lovely talk under uh, quite unusual constraints for you, uh, <laughs> for which you have kept a, a, an, an incredible calm all throughout. So that is really, really something I can um, I congratulate you on, as well as the quality of, of your of your presentation. Um, I, I would have a few um, a, a few questions. Um, the, the first one being. The, the primitive form, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you are unbelievable. He's not even my dog. I'm just looking after him for a friend who's in hospital. Oh, he's <laughs> not yours, but he likes you very much. <laughs> he likes being annoying. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, so, yes, the, the, the cannibalism is seen as as a sign of, of uh, I quote, primitive form of human development. Um, in, in Maya's testimony, I, I, there is a, a word that, um, that I, I don't know the, the, the German version, but you translated it as untamed, which is, um, which is extremely animal in, in, its, in its meaning. And in the same quote, there is lowest, stage of human de development, I was thinking it might even be a lower stage of non-human development since since that that word is is extremely mm. is extremely uh, I, I think it's like it's pur purposely or purposefully chosen, but it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, we will be discussing this tomorrow uh, tomorrow morning with with Guillaume and I because the animalization of the Malakulans is also very present in in the literature in, on Malakula. So that's interesting as well. And thank you. Uh, so it's basically it wasn't really a question, but, <laughs> but can I can I say something? Yeah, yeah sure, 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 sure. Fire is interesting because um, he uh, was a great admirer of Alfred Russell Wallace. Um, he translated a number of Wallace's works, including the Malay Archipelago, into German. Uh, and I, so I think, you know, he would have been very aware of um, uh, evolutionary theory, Darwinian evolution. But um, I don't think, you know, it's difficult to say because he never quite spells it out. But um, certainly he, he was a monogenist. I mean, he didn't believe that different human races or varieties had evolved separately. He believed in a common origin um, of all human race. He did call them races. But I think um, he certainly also implies that there's a kind of universal trajectory that, that these different human races follow and um, particular, I mean, it's partly to do with the way people look with their biology, but I think more to do with their um, with cultural markers, so things like cannibalism, um, things like clothing, things like uh, agriculture, and um, whether people have a nomadic or, or a settled lifestyle. Uh, and really, honestly, also, did he have a good experience with them or not? Were they nice to him or not? I mean, it really, it sounds very basic, but actually the people that he speaks most highly of and thinks are, you know, the, the most kind of civilised amongst the Papuans are the ones that were friendliest to him and um, gave him the least trouble, I guess, during his visit. So, and I think um, that is probably reflected to some extent in other, other travellers' um, depictions of particular peoples as well. I, I would have a, a, a second question about um, uh, Finch's... Uh, testimony which uh, I, I discovered thanks to you um, 
where, where he says, the picture which I sketched from life represents the scene as the victors cut up the body in the slain man in workmanlike fashion in the shallow waters of the bay, smoking their pipes. Meanwhile, a young man with a flute plays his sweetest airs, just as usual, and a crowd spot on, his, on the strand of spectators. Do you think that this kind of uh, paradoxical uh, way of seeing it, his, he, he, he insists on the fact that people act like in a normal fashion, do you think that what he is actually assisting to is a ceremony with someone playing a flute that is a sacred flute and people uh, assembled in a customary manner rather than playing around? Oh, that, yeah, I think that's very possible. I mean, it's... Um... I think he I think he had a limited understanding of what he was seeing, and he certainly didn't speak um, the local language. Um, I gather he made himself understood in in pigeon. He had some some pigeon. but um, yes, I think that's very possible. I guess what I found what I find interesting about his depiction is what the 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 use that he makes of that contrast because this is a publication for um, a very general audience. I mean, Finch was, he did publish in scientific journals as well, but um, he, he wrote a lot for daily newspapers for um, this particular one was like an illustrated magazine um, really intended for a, a general audience, like the general public. So it's, and he really makes an effort in this article to kind of shake people's um, preconceptions at every turn, you know, um, he starts off with a little dialogue about, oh, I've just got back from New Guinea and everybody asks me, you know, what was it like amongst those poor naked savages? Uh, they're all cannibals, aren't they? And he says, you know, well, um, what you think of as savages is completely wrong. And um, and then he kind of proceeds to explain why. And he has a very high opinion of um, um, Indigenous uh, New Guinean people. I mean, from Mutbud Island, from New Britain, but more generally... Um, it is also to do with a, partly to do with a, a sort of a social trajectory, you know, the, the, the fact that they practice agriculture and the fact that they have um, fine art and music um, kind of counterbalances the fact that they don't wear clothes and they're cannibals. Um, and it's really, I mean, I've only found one instance in which he, he's actually prepared to say, you know, this is completely relative. Um, we think these things are evil, but to them it's independent of morality. You know, we can't judge it. Other than that, he sort of oscillates quite a lot. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Does uh, Does anyone have any other questions? Quelqu'un dans la salle no? A-t-il euh, des questions pour euh, Hilary que je suis tout à fait euh, prêt à traduire éventuellement? Mieux que... Ben, je crois qu'on a une question. Ah, c'est vrai. James. Yes. Oh, OK, go ahead, James. Yeah. Um, and uh, apologies to everyone for asking the question in English, but I think that's probably best for all of us, including me. Best for me. <laughs> Um, I, I, I wonder, it sounded like you were alluding to the idea that some of the German language kind of conceptualizations of savagery were slightly different to, to how they're articulated in English. And I, I'm, I'm wondering if sort of how that articulates later on when you get, you know, the sort of Anglophone um, anthropology you know, tradition of kind of dividing cultures up like Tyler and Morgan, you know, the idea that there's savagery, barbarism and civilization. Mm -hmm. Does that get articulated differently in a in a German language setting um, that then gets kind of tied into these conversations about anthropophagy and, and where it puts people on that ladder? Um, it's a good question. I think really the um, European discourses are very interdependent. So um, I mean, it's not always easy to say, you know, who was reading exactly whose works, but um, you can certainly see ideas about primitism um, from people like Montaigne, for example, in um, De Cannibal, and um, from uh, Alexander Pope and others uh, sort of being expressed in German works. Um, 
uh, and, and, and a lot of these people's works were translated into German, so they were available. And mm. conversely, uh, a lot of these German speakers' works were either published initially in English, like the, the Forsters' works came out in English and oh. were then translated into German. Mm. Um, or um, so Langsdorf that I mentioned on the Russian voyage, um, published initially in German, but uh, his works were translated into, I believe, Rus at least Russian and um, English, possibly other languages. Um, you certainly also see uh, an influence of some of the Scottish um, Enlightenment philosophers who, who posit this sort of uh, for, uh, stadial theory. So, um, you know, evolution through different stages of, of social development. Um, so I, I mean, really, probably the main difference I think you might expect to see um, amongst German German speaking intellectuals is that they, they don't have quite so much of a stake in um, uh, colonial power relations because up until 1884, 85, uh, Germany has no colonies, colonies in the Pacific. So if they're visiting the Pacific, it's not, um, you know, they're in, they're in other people's colonies or they're in nobody's colonies. They're generally travelling with uh, the voyages of other nations and I, th I think in a way perhaps that gives them a bit more space to be more to take a more a more relativist stance, to be more understanding of cannibalism. Mm. Um, it has its limits, but, um, you know, I mean, that would be my suspicion that perhaps that, that fact um, plays a role. Yeah, really interesting. Thank you.